Following the devastation of the Second World War, there were very few countries in Europe that managed to avoid aligning with the new victors in some form or another. The former Axis powers were occupied and integrated into the new ideological blocs of the West or the East, especially after the infamous Iron Curtain descended upon Europe in 1946, at least according to Winston Churchill. Those left in the middle either adopted absolute neutrality or caved into pressure and became involved in the Cold War. For nations that fought and were defeated in the war, it seemed unimaginable that they would be allowed to control their independence or future. No country better understood this than Finland, which sat right on the northern edge next to the Soviet Union. In this video, we'll be exploring how despite its extremely precarious circumstances, Finland was able to remain neutral during the Cold War. Don't forget to like, subscribe, all that fun stuff, as it does help a ton. Without further ado, let's delve right in. Finland on the eve of the Second World War had been independent for over 20 years, having freed itself from Russian control during the Russian Civil War in 1917. The interwar years were characterised by relative economic growth with an explosion in population to 3.7 million people. The country had established a presence on the world stage as a member of the League of Nations, and a signatory of many different treaties such as the Kellogg-Briand Pact in 1928, which renounced the use of war as a diplomatic tool. Relations with the Soviets were somewhat peaceful if tense, as an ever-present fear that one day Finland would be invaded always played in the minds of its military leaders. Agreements had been signed recognising the border between the two countries, but if these would hold would be anyone's guess. When war came knocking in September 1939, Finland nervously watched from the sidelines and very soon the war would reach them too. Soon after the war began, the Soviets issued demands for territorial adjustments, especially around Finnish Karelia, close to Leningrad. Fearing that the Finns or Germans would invade from the north, the Soviets sought to secure their border by force if necessary. The people of Finland knew that militarily defeating the Soviets on their own would be next to impossible, so hopes were placed on support from the west if the worst ever came. Despite assurances from the Finnish government that no attacks would come from their territory, the Red Army staged a false flag operation and launched a full invasion on the 30th of November 1939. Despite being severely underestimated and inflicting pretty horrendous casualties on the Soviets, the Finns were forced to sign a peace treaty in March 1940 and cede parts of Karelia and other territory. Gustav Mannerheim, the commander-in-chief of the Finnish army, was unwilling to further antagonise the Soviet Union for fears that a complete invasion would lead to the end of Finland's statehood. But when Germany invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941, an opportunity for the Finns to regain their land was handed to them on a silver plate. In what would become known as the Continuation War, Finland joined Germany and its allies in invading the Soviets with the aim of retaking Karelia. Even after suffering a defeat in the previous war with 24,000 casualties, the Finns were able to advance further than the original borders, with some hardline nationalists even proposing that they seize all of this land. Finland's relationship with Germany could probably be best summed up as ambivalent, as though they both shared a goal in defeating the Soviets, cooperation didn't extend beyond this. Nevertheless, the continuation war lasted until September of 1944, when the Finns signed another peace treaty with Moscow, ceding further land and agreeing to a joint operation with the Red Army to expel all German soldiers from Finnish soil. The Third War, and yes, there was a third one, would be known as the Lapland War, which devastated the northern sections of Finland. Once the war came to an end, Finland was one of the lucky ones, well, relatively, yet it soon found itself at the mercy of its massive neighbour to the east. Deeming it too costly to fully take over Finland, the Soviets approached with a Treaty of Friendship, which was later accepted by President Juho Pasekivi. In exchange for retaining their independence and control over their own internal affairs, Finland would embrace absolute neutrality. They would be forbidden from joining NATO and exempt from the Warsaw Pact. Furthermore, they were to not oppose the Soviets in foreign policy and prevent any foreign armies from invading through them. Whilst this seemed to be the country's best chance for survival, the treaty would serve as a source of political contention. For the West, the FCMA treaty seemed to bind Finland to the Soviets, yet relations between the two were still warm. By 1956, Pasakivi had been succeeded by Erho Kakonen, who continued the policy of active neutrality. By this time, a lot had already been achieved, from the withdrawal of Soviet troops on Finnish islands, as well as the payment of reparations and domestic stabilisation but Kokonen's legacy today remains controversial in many aspects. In his book, A History of Finland, Henrik Meinander states that Kokonen's decision to strictly abide by the treaty drew a lot of criticism, especially given his close links with Soviet security services. 
Conversely, it was these very links that enabled Finland some room to manoeuvre in the international arena, later joining the United Nations and Nordic Council during Nikita Khrushchev's term. Kekkonen would be re-elected after 1956, not once, not twice, but three times, only resigning in 1981. His close links with the Soviets had kept them at bay for decades, whilst pursuing a policy of active nuclear disarmament and neutrality had also helped them garner respect across the world. For example, recognising both West and East Germany helped legitimise their neutral stance. Yet Finland's relationship with the Soviet Union came at a domestic cost. As per the FCMA treaty, the media had to be relatively restrained in terms of criticism and anti-Soviet rhetoric, whilst Kokonin often relied on Soviet pressure to stay in power. When Kokonin was finally succeeded by Mauno Koivisto in 1982, the policy of appeasing Moscow was replaced by a harder line against the Soviets, yet the desire to remain cordial was still strong amongst Finnish people. As the Soviet Union entered into an era of stagnation combined with the resurrection of the arms race with the West, Finland began to explore its options. In 1985, it joined the European Free Trade Association, paving the way for EU membership. The collapse of the Eastern Bloc and later the Soviet Union itself from 1989 to 91 drastically altered the geopolitical situation, which was taken full advantage of by Finland as the FCMA treaty was quickly nullified. By the end of the 20th century, Finland was a complete member of the EU and had begun to align itself closer with NATO. The policy of neutrality still held on, only being overturned in May of last year when Finland officially applied to join NATO, at least at the time of making this video. So, with all this, how did Finland stay neutral in the Cold War? In combination with masterful political manoeuvring from Finland's leaders and strict adherence to the FCMA treaty, Finland ultimately presented itself as a trustworthy international partner to both the West and the Soviet Union. And when the Union collapsed, Finland was able to quickly align with the West at a speed far faster than the former Soviet puppet states could. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. Leave a like, subscribe, comment, all the usual stuff. This one took a bit longer to come out than I would have liked because I got COVID like a month ago and also the uni semesters just started again so I basically had like zero time. But nevertheless, the grind continues so go get yourself some Pringles or something.